All financial support for this podcast comes from my patrons on patreon.com. If you'd like to join in with the patrons, please check out patreon.com slash Darwin Gross. That's D-A-R-W-I-N-G-R-O-S-S-E. Now enjoy the podcast. All right. Today I have the great opportunity to talk to somebody. I, I've actually been kind of trying to chase her down for a little while, uh, but we were finally able to get uh, some open time. Her name's Eleni Lilius. She has got a lot of titles. First of all, she's a composer of quite known. Uh, in fact, several of the people I've interviewed, people like uh, uh, Stephen Rippenthal, uh, Jane Regler, other people have talked about doing, uh, working on her compositions, playing her compositions. So uh, active composer, performer. Uh, she's also the professor of creative Arts Excellence at Bowling Green State University in Ohio, and is the Director of Composition Activities for Splice Institute. So now you can see why it's been difficult getting her <laughs> to have, have a seat. But after all of that, I am very excited to have this chat with Lainey. Hey, how's it going? Hello. Thank you so much for inviting me and for your tenacity in trying to get us together. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I suspect it's going to be worth it. Uh, let's kick this off by talking a little bit about all of these things you do. First of all, your your work as both a, a professor uh, at Bowling Green as well as uh, working with the Splice Institute. What do those represent as well as uh, what your compositional and performance activities have been like lately? Thank you for asking. I think, you know, as a composer, we maybe should think that composing is the most important thing that we do. But for me, I think inspiring other people to be creative and specifically to be creative in using technology is to me the most important thing that I do. So I have through my job at Bowling Green State University and also through Splice Institute especially, have the opportunity to inspire, hopefully inspire young generations of composers and performers to explore technology and to be creative in ways maybe that they didn't think they could be or didn't realize they could be to open doors for them to just think about sound and think about all the sounds that surround us and how they can listen to those in a more intentful way and and explore them either as composers as performers i have a former student who is an entrepreneur who goes out and records environmental soundscapes. So in all of these different ways to, to be creative and to listen to the many sounds that surround us in this world, or that could be created using synthesis, of course. Right, right. Now, it's <laughs> interesting because so oftentimes we sort of like think of composers as having sort of like one track through the world and people who are trying to inspire through teaching, education, whatever, is another track. But mm -hmm. you seem to have really connected them both into sort of like a, a really nice career for yourself. How is that possible? How do you have the time to be a composer when you have a really robust edu educational academic life, especially mm -hmm. when involved, you're involved with Splice Institute? How how do you maintain an opportunity to still still do composition and work with performers and that kind of stuff? Well, it's challenging. I you know I started laughing when you started asking that question. <laughs> I knew where you were going, and I was going to say, well, you know, I don't do it very well. And I think <laughs> one of the things we all struggle with in our lives is this idea of balance, right? Trying to you know you can read all kinds of articles about this work life balance, right? Well, guess what? Work is work, life is life, and they they both are the same with each other. You know, when you're a creative person, right? You're creative activities are your work and your creative activities are also your life. So what does that mean? You know, how do you make that all fit? Well, you know, it's a struggle. And I don't think that my situation is much different than anyone else. We, we do the best we can to try to find time or make time. I do a lot of my composing during winter breaks 
during summer breaks. I also try to remain compositionally active during the academic year. I have a, a day or so a week that I have set aside for composing. And I think one of the nice things about being involved in the academy is that there is a there's sort of a give and take. There's a, a symbiotic relationship, I think, that develops between a professor and their student. Perhaps not everybody, you know, not everybody has that. But with many of my students over the years, I do my best to inspire them. And they, in turn, inspire me. They give me ideas and they challenge me in different ways to think about the creative process differently than I have. And so I think it's thanks to many of my students, former and present, that I can claim that a number of my pieces are experiments, that they're, they're different ways of thinking about music than ways that I may have done otherwise if it weren't for the, for the influence of my students. That makes a lot of sense. Now, I, I would say one of the things I think of when I, when I think about you and your work is that you actually do a lot of collaborative work. I mean, here you talk about uh, about collaborations with students, but also working with a lot of performance, collaboration mm -hmm. with performance people. Dad had to see a significant shift with the magic of COVID, right? Yes, I have been very fortunate to collaborate with a number of really great performers. Uh, and maybe we'll talk about that before it's all said and done. Things did change during COVID. It was funny that I was by myself, you know, during the shutdown, which meant I, I somehow had more time to compose. But like many people, not a whole lot of inspiration to do so. Mm -hmm. And then when things started to open up, all of a sudden, all these all the deadlines start that had been postponed started kind of piling up again. But one of the great things that happened to me during the during COVID during the pandemic was that I was approached by Scott Deal, who is one of my long term collaborators, percussionist, music technologist, Scott Deal, who teaches at IUPUI in Indianapolis. And he said to me, he said, hey, Lainey, let's let's start a, an improv. Let's start a, a telematic improv group. I said, yeah, Scott, that sounds great. He said, and let's do it with Chris Biggs. Well, Chris Biggs is the is the big head of Splice, and uh, he teaches at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo. So the three of us got together, and of course, Scott and Chris had been doing a lot of improvising on their own, Scott with other telematic groups, and Chris also with some distance types of things and in-person things. And I felt a little intimidated, you know, getting together with them. Of course, composing is its own kind of creative activity, and I do a lot of improvising as part of that creative process, but not improvising necessarily with other people. But we started getting together every week and improvising together, Scott playing on various percussion instruments, Chris and I processing Scott in real time. We're using Sonobus, and I'm using Max and Chris is using Ableton Live. And it was really a blast and we started doing projects together and now Chris and I are also both performing and Scott performing and we're all processing each other. And it has been a really nice way to remain creative during the pandemic, to experiment with something that I didn't have time to do before the pandemic. Like how can right. you add one more thing, right? Yeah, right, exactly. Um, to experiment with and I have found that it's just another way of exploring creativity and what that means and then you think well how is that going to influence your composing and and I don't really know yet you know mm -hmm. I haven't haven't been doing it long enough but you know <laughs> was that, so that was the first time that you had done a telematic kind of performance thing yes yes it's the first time I had done telematics I had done some live improvising with people in a couple of other instances over the years, but not anything really serious. Uh -huh. So this was the first time I had done any kind of distance yeah. telematic type stuff. Is it something you think you'll do more of? Well, we still are meeting every week. Huh? Well, that's that And we've amazing. got a couple of projects that are out there and we're working on another one now. And we're starting to talk about doing some of these things live and 
that's where I have to start thinking to myself, okay, Lainey, <laughs> time, <laughs> time to put on your big girl panties, you know, <laughs> like you, you're going to have to stand up in front of real people now. It's not just going to be, you know, with your buddies online and then you are right. going to make a video of it. And so I got to kind of work on that. I have to yeah. admit that I started out life as a performer and I found performance very stressful and I stopped doing it and went into composing thinking, oh, good, I can just sit in the back, you know? <laughs> well, we know that's not true. You know, you're a composer. And they, well, sooner or later, you got to, you know, either they you're haul, They haul your butt on stage, right? Yeah, exactly. you know, so, um, so it's, you know, I guess maybe that's one of my New Year's resolutions is to, to, to haul my butt on stage, <laughs> as you just said, you know? And so I guess maybe your listeners can can hold me to that, you know, okay. maybe the podcast listeners can say, we're waiting for yeah. you. They'll Where cor- are they'll you? They'll corner you at the next conference, right? It's going to be like <laughs> December 28th of 2022. And they're going to be emailing me saying, Lilios, that was your New Year's resolution. You've got three days, get it together. <laughs> so, um, Boy, there's a bunch of stuff I want to talk about. Before we get into it, though, one of the things that I like uh, that really is a part of this podcast is talking to people about the background and their background and how they got to be the artists that they are. And I'm curious, uh, uh, you are a self-avowed Max user, uh, but a composer. Your educational background is significant. Uh, you studied under someone who's work, who I really re- enjoyed working with and working around, Larry Austin. I'm curious how you grow up in and become wh- who you are. So tell me a story. Sure. Well, I can tell you that I don't really know, in a certain way, I don't really know how I ended up here. But in another way, when I look back on things, it all kind of makes sense that I just happened to maybe sort of be in the right places at the right time. I grew up in the Chicago suburbs. I'm actually from the Chicago area. And um, my dad had come over on the boat from Greece when he was 21. He's an immigrant. And my mother was born in Chicago. And I grew up in a very sort of middle class family. My dad was a carpenter. He had never finished high school. My mother had not gone to college. So I don't come from an academic family. I come from a very kind of almost lower middle class, middle, middle class family. But I had a couple of very interesting things happen to me when I was a kid. One thing that happened to me when I was a kid is that at for some birthday, I don't even remember when, somebody gave me a little transistor radio. And I know this to be true of, oh, well, Pauline talks about how she received a a recorder for her birthday, Pauline Oliveros. I received a transistor radio when I was a kid. And I used to, you know, ride up and down the driveway on my bicycle, listening to this transistor radio. And I found myself always kind of twisting the dial, right? Listening to the songs that were on the radio. Of course, it was AM at that time. But then also listening to all that super cool static and how the voices could get garbled when you started untuning them, you know, from their, when you would detune them from their station and you'd have all that, you know, and it'd be all the static stuff. And I just found that super cool. And so... I would just play around with that. And I don't know why I did that. It was just interesting to me. And then at the same, a couple of years later, the girl down the street from us, who was a very good friend of mine, Gina Pepitone, she was taking organ lessons. And I went down and Gina was playing the organ one day and I was there and she was playing the organ. And I thought, this is amazing. And so I went home and I said to my mom and dad, I said, I want to play organ like Gina. (laughs) And so my parents, God bless them. My mother wasn't working and my dad wasn't making a lot of money. I don't know how they afforded it, but they bought an organ and they started giving me organ lessons. And I was very fortunate to study with a woman, Adele Scott Sullivan, who had gotten her doctorate uh, from the University of Illinois. And I started playing all kinds of organ repertoire, of course, Bach and Couperin and Buxtehude and then some more contemporary things. And um, 
And then one day I went to my organ lesson and my teacher said, um, well, Eleni, today, I, I think maybe I was 11. She said, today we're going to learn how to compose. You know, I was 11. I didn't really know what that meant. I was like, oh, okay, sure. You know, <laughs> and I started composing organ music. And from there, things just kind of snowballed because I think being an organist, that of course led me to wanting a synthesizer. And then getting a synthesizer led me to somehow discovering the Oberlin Conservatory summer camp there that used to be called MIDI, MIDI right. something. I can't even remember the name of it now, but in 1986, I went over to the, to the Oberlin Conservatory MIDI camp and started playing with modular, you know, analog synthesizers. And then I went to college and I just said, this stuff is awesome. I just want to do this. And I was still writing instrumental music, but that was kind of the beginning of, of my foray into electroacoustic music. And I think it's because of the organ. That's, that's really amazing. Now, going, going to school and, and, getting, uh, and getting a basic education is great, but there's, at, at least in the time frame when you were, were going, especially if you're going on the composition track, music education was a very, very highly structured thing. Mm -hmm. And so walking in and saying, well, I like turning the knobs on a modular synth, it wasn't really an environment that was conducive to saying, okay, let's make your own degree or whatever, right? It was, oh, yes. uh, you would have had to still follow the very traditional track of yes. composition, counterpoint, and all these kind of things, right? Yes, I did. But I was also, again, very fortunate to somehow end up at Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, Illinois, which at that time was populated by uh, a number of composers on faculty there who had been at the University of Illinois in the 60s uh, with Herbert Brun, with Salvatore oh. Martirano. Okay. They, one of the composers had played in the Harry Parch Ensemble. And so my composition teachers had come from this super experimental environment Got at it. the University of Illinois. Then in the 1980s, when I was at Northern Illinois University, was still kind of on the tail end of that sort of highly experimental mindset. And I was lucky to start my electronic music studies with a guy named Joe Pinzeroni, who had later left there and went out to California to do some things. But you know, I started with, they, they were all about this idea of experimentation. And so even though I was in an environment where I did take, you know, all of my music theory and oral skills and music history, counterpoint, uh, acoustic composition lessons, etc., there was also this really experimental vibe that right. permeated NIU at that time. And I think that I really benefited from that, that it made me realize that, you know, yes, I could put notes on the page, but that there were other ways to be creatively expressive. And it was, of course, either through through things like graphic notation, if you wanted to still write for acoustic instruments, but then also through the electronic medium. And I started with analog tape and then went to analog synthesizers and then into computer programming fourth j fourth on the you know pdp 11 mm -hmm. so it was it was old school there at right. the time which you know i'm really thankful for it was awesome well also if uh <laughs> if if you were working with fourth all of a sudden then something like uh max just seems like uh a, a very like light years more efficient to oh, be able yes. to do something right. Oh, absolutely. Yes. You know, I sure once once I started learning Max, I abandoned programming. And you know, there were some people who said, How could you not program your own <laughs> stuff? And I just said, you know, I said, um, I got to a point in my career where I realized I could not do it all. I'm not talented enough to be a programmer and be a composer. And I had to choose one and you know, when I was taking C programming classes and we started talking about dynamic memory allocation and pointers to pointers, my literal brain 
kind of exploded. And if I didn't know, you know, like if I couldn't identify where that thing was in memory, <laughs> like right. now I think I could do better at it because I've learned to abstract things a little better. But at that time, I was like, what do you mean? I don't know where it is in memory. <laughs> what do you, you know, I, I, what do you mean? I just have to know it's there. I, I want to know it's there and I want to know where it's at, you know, and, and what do you mean? I've got to point to this thing that's pointed to some other yeah, thing. Right. And I just, you know, when we got to that in C program, I, I just said, you know what? I don't think I'm cut out for this. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. That's but you know that's kind of a common breaking point for people though too. So that's that's interesting. I just had like br brain explosion, and then on top of that, I always was overly complexifying all of my programs. So you know, mm. you'd get an assignment, and it would say there'd be assignment, you know, to program this this thing, program this algorithm, whatever it was. Mm. And so I'd start programming it, and then I'd start thinking, yeah, but. <laughs> then there's where you start going wrong, right? As a programmer, you start to use the word but. Right. And then the two words, the also like two words of death that you put after that are what and if. <laughs> <laughs> right? But what if the yeah. user wants to do this? Or yeah. what if the user wants to do that? And so I started taking these very simple assignments and turning them into these humongous yeah, option apps. overload yeah yeah and um you know always talking about well this edge case or this edge case and <laughs> and i just i had to stop and now you know i am happy to say that i i try to rein that in with my max programming i try to keep things modular which is how i teach my students you know we're mm -hmm. going to build one module and this module is going to do this algorithm this function and then we're going to build another module. And I think it's, you know, compartmentalizing in that way. It makes programming a little bit easier to manage. So you came to this fork in the road where you decided that you were going to be a composer. But I mean, anyone can say they're a composer. But at some point, you have to A, compose, and B, have someone willing to perform your compositions. Right. Um, what were what were the breaks for you what what cracked it open for you what were the opportunities that came that made it happen well i think the the first thing was just being at northern illinois university and having that super experimental environment where you know kind of anything goes and we used to do these happenings where we'd set up these crazy humongous tape loops in one room and record people in another room on the tape loops and we you know there were all these sort of crazy open house things and crazy concerts that we did and that you know that i think it helped me to sort of open my mind to the possibility that music doesn't necessarily have to be just executed or articulated in one way that there are many different ways that we can be creative and many different ways that we can articulate our ideas. That was one, I think, very fortunate break for me. Another is that after I was done at Northern Illinois University, as you mentioned, I, I went to the University of North Texas where I studied with Larry Austin. And of course, North Texas had a big experiment, has a big experimental music history with Merrill Ellis and Larry, of course, also with his involvement with Source Magazine the music of the avant-garde um and so that experimentation was con continued to be encouraged and i was doing a lot of electroacoustic music there of course they called there they called it computer music i started working yes. with next <laughs> next machines there then my next great break was that i managed uh, somehow to wheedle my way into the good favor of john t harrison who was at the University of Birmingham in the UK and managed to go to Birmingham to study with Jaunty for a year. And that really changed the way that I thought about music. In my training and working with Larry, my studies were very kind of dictated, which isn't a bad thing. You know, you come to your lesson and you, Larry always wanted to know what the title of the piece was how long it was going to be, what the form of it was going to be, you know, so he was a very sort of predetermined kind of composer that you you determine a number of these elements ahead of time, and then you execute the task, whatever that task is, whatever you're writing for, whether it's a solo flute piece or an orchestra piece or, or, or fixed media piece or whatever. 
But then when I went to the University of Birmingham, John T kind of turned all that on its head. And, and you know, here I am, this, this you know, American kid going over to, to the UK and, and I want to make a good first impression with John T. Harrison. You know, I, I've got my first lesson with the great John T. Harrison. So I sat down and I got my composition notebook out because that's what Larry was all about, the composition notebook. You got to write it all down, journal, which is also great. I wrote it all down. This is the name of the piece. This is how long the piece is. This is all the sounds that are going to be in this piece. So I meet with John T. And I'm so proud of myself. I'm like, I am ready. You know, I'm ready for this. And he says, so, Lainey, you know, what are you going to do? And I'm like, yes, I got it, you know. And I, I read all these things right off. And he looks at me and he kind of smiles and gives me this bemused look. And he says, well, how do you know that? <laughs> and I, I started spluttering, you know, like, buh, 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 you know, ah, ah, you know, breakdown, <laughs> lesson number one, <laughs> crisis. <laughs> and, you know, so over a period of, of a year that I studied with John T, he taught me sort of a different way of thinking about composition in, in that, you know, if you are composing from the standpoint of the sounds themselves, that it's the sounds that dictate what's going to happen in the piece, how long the piece is going to be, what the eventual title is going to be. And that until you create those sounds and manipulate those sounds or process them in various ways, build a relationship with your material, you can't, I mean, you can, right? You can predetermine all those things, but really that if you allow the sounds to do what they're going to do, to be themselves, as it were, that uh, you can make some really great discoveries that you might not otherwise, because you're trying to get that square peg in that round hole. Right, right. right. And so my composing changed quite a bit working with Jaunty, and I shifted over to a more materials-based way of working with music. And now I have sort of this hybrid method, a little bit influenced by the sort of pre-compositional thing and, and a lot influenced by the materials-based idea. That's really interesting, but that also really helps make sense out of, you know, as I listen to the breadth of your music, I mean, so many of the pieces are very different, but it, it is one of those things where your voice comes through, even when other people are performing, you know, your, your compositions. And it makes sense that by starting with that material thing, that would be sort of like the foundational voice that's attached to everything else that's done. Mm -hmm. And that's where that uh, collaboration with performers comes in. Mm -hmm. So when you when you are composing fixed media music, your materials are the sounds that you recorded or the sounds that you are synthesizing. And so you can you have those you've created them. But when you are working with a performer, they are eventually going to be the person that's creating the sound. Right. And so when I started working with Scott Deal, for instance, Scott has all of his percussion stuff set up in his basement. And he said, Elaney, why don't you come on out to Indianapolis and let's just spend a couple of days playing around with all my stuff. Again, materials based composition. But now instead of me standing in a studio with my pots and pans or whatever it it is that I'm recording. Now I have another, another creative individual, a mm -hmm. virtuosic performer who is saying, Hey, I got this instrument and I've got all these mallets and, you know, and so now that, that experimentation, that creative experimentation is shared. Right. Yeah. It's, it can be a sort of a creative loop back. That's, that's yes. really interesting. What was the first major performance of your work from your perspective when did when did that happen i think that the first major performance of one of my pieces was a piece that i had composed at north texas a little five and a half minute 
fixed media piece called Seller that got accepted to Seamus 1996, which was in Birmingham, Alabama. And that was the second time that I had met John T. Harrison. And when I was able to kind of talk him into letting me study with him was at that Seamus conference. So I think that was sort of my first big break, as it were, into the community of electroacoustic practitioners. I had gone to International Computer Music Conference in 1995 in Banff, but I only went as an observer. I didn't have a piece performed. Mm -hmm. So Seamus in 1996 was like my my break in to the to the community. And from there, I then I had gone to England and I composed a lot of fixed media music and had a number of performances there and then in germany and i started having because of the pieces i was making there i started building a little bit of a career over there and when i came back then i started having more performances and i would say maybe the first piece that the that us audiences probably remember of mine is a piece called arturo which is based on some interviews I did with a tarot card reader who I met in Denton, Texas. Uh, it's, it's a little sort of radiophonic work about him. And uh, that has had that had a lot of performances kind of early on. And so later what happened was I was composing all these fixed media pieces and performers were hearing them at conferences, at Seamus, at Electronic Music Midwest, here and there. And then I then performers started asking me to write for them. And that's when I kind of returned to writing for instruments, but this time with electronics. Yeah, it's really interesting. Now, I am really amazed when, and, and people who are listening who maybe haven't haven't uh, heard a lot of Eleni's work can, can go. I, I think some of the great things to do is to go on YouTube and find performers that are performing performing your work. Yes. Um, one of the things that's, that really is mind boggling though, is there are performers performing your work very much doing the thing that they do, but also with a laptop that has a lot of, that has a lot of material from you. So are you like making max patches that you send? How do you actually accomplish these kinds of things? Because like I have, um, I saw I saw Jane Wrigler do a piece of yours, and and you weren't there, but uh, the noisemakers were. And <laughs> I'm I'm curious, how do you set up a performer to actually do your work? Uh, do you provide the notation? Do you provide them a program? Do you f provide mm -hmm. them a bunch of samples, or do you give them instructions on collecting stuff? How does that work? Mm, thank you for asking. So I, I have to say that I'm probably a little bit traditional and boring in the way that I that that this works. So I compose when I compose for instrumentalists with electronics, depending on the collaborator, I always try to do what the collaborator wants. So if the collaborator wants live electronics, I use Max. If the collaborator wants fixed media, I make a fixed media track and then have it trigger using Max, right? So Max is somehow involved, I think, yeah. in, in everything, right? But so first I kind of try to find out what do you want? Do you want something that is going to process your instrument in real time? Or do you want something that is just a fixed media thing that you can just play, play along, along with, right? right? Yeah. Kind of thing. And so once we determine that, then I compose the piece thinking really about the performer. I, I always want the performer to be at the front and center of what's going on. And what live electronics allows me to do is sort of just create this, you know, a lot of people talk about this, so there's nothing new in this, this idea of a meta instrument to make that instrument seem larger than it is. So the long and short of it is that I write the piece, I create a score, and then I create a max patch. And I have a signal processing toolbox that I have built in max that has all the sort of typical things that you might expect feedback delays, exponential delays, chorus, panners, reverb, tremolos, granulators, that kind of thing. And I have them all I have it all built in a toolbox set up like a mixer. 
a mixer with aux sends, basically, where mm -hmm. you can have a process come in and then send any effect to any other effect. Got it. Right. Like a big so, matrix mixing system, yeah. Yes, yes, Got exactly. It. Now I'm using MC matrix, huh. which is really great. Uh, <laughs> I discovered the MC family the MC of world. objects. Yeah. yeah. And so I create a max patch. And one of my goals is to create something that is, I'm knocking on wood here while I'm talking to you, that is reliable, that is easy to use, that is going to work that a performer can use. I, I have these USB foot pedals that I buy from Delcom mm -hmm. that, you know, with a USB foot pedal, a performer can control the patch themselves. So I program just these scenes, basically. And each scene is a different set of effects in Max. And so that means I don't have to be there. Yeah, that was one of the big questions I have because so many of your works are multi-sectional. And that can be really difficult Yeah. Uh, if yeah, it's a character flaw well or it's it's definitely what i would say is it is definitely a differentiator because it's hard to do electronic pieces that are multi multi-segmented if unless you do purely fixed media you know anything mm -hmm. that's performative anything that does live electronics it's hard to take that and pass that along to somebody because so often the setup from one section to the next can be so difficult that if mm. you're not there sort of like, you know, juggling the chainsaws, it's not going to be able to happen uh -huh. properly, right? Yeah. But um, so you just, you literally set it up so that foot pedals can walk you through. Yes. Through the yes, performance. Yes, it's it. I mean, in some uh, in some instances, depending on the piece, I use some pitch tracking. There are a couple of pieces of mine that use some amplitude tracking. But by and large, the electronics for the pieces are are basically their scenes that I set up in Max, and I'm your the performer is simply stepping through the scenes, and I try to create. There are some some randomness that comes in with some of the effects and to, to try to make it a little bit more dynamic. I think that's something that uh, I'm always trying to do. But there's a balance there too, because having dynamics is important, but having it kind of goof proof is also going to be a little bit important in this case as well, right? I'll tell you, it really is. And I, tr I test my patches pretty extensively. But every now and again, somebody will reach out to me and say, you know, I have a piece from, I think, 2007 that people are still playing. And just a couple of months ago, I had someone contact me and say, I couldn't get your patch working. And I'm thinking, this piece has had 100 performances. Why is the patch? And it's the same patch. Like, mm -hmm. why is it not working? I don't know. And maybe it, I suspect it's something that has to do with that person's computer, right? right. Something having to sure. do with their system. But, you know, just a couple of months ago, I had a piece canceled because the performer couldn't get the patch running. And, and it's somebody who has played the piece many, many times. Maybe this particular person has played the piece maybe eight or 10 times already. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I just got it. It's not working. It's I've been playing it all this time and now all of a sudden it doesn't work. I'm thinking, what the heck? But yeah, that troubleshooting part to me is very important because I want performers to feel, I want them to feel like they can play my piece and that they can be creative and virtuosic and feel confident that when they push that pedal, the next thing is gonna happen, that it's gonna work and that it's gonna work every time. Yeah, oh. so critical. Let's talk about about the process of from inception to completion. Now, I am going to point my podcast listeners to another piece on YouTube. You actually did a, a lecture at Georgia Southern, mm -hmm. which was kind of fabulous. And part of what you talked about there was the was all of the things that are considerations in the creation of a piece. You know, so it was like a variety of things like uh, I actually drew a picture of it, you know, so sound versus silence, frequency, timbre, density, performability, stuff like that. Right. 
Um, and I thought that that was really great because it sort of gave us, gave an insight into how you think of bringing a piece together. But once you sort of like have a, have a concept or maybe even before you have a concept, what is the process you go through from maybe, maybe the impetus is like, I got to do something you know, mm -hmm. for somebody. Yeah. Somebody says I have to do something. Yeah, somebody says I have to do something. Yeah, maybe, that, <laughs> maybe that's the generator. How do you get from there to being like, okay, it's done, shipped out the door? Yeah, well, you know, that's, that's kind of funny. My husband calls me a deadline composer. So, you know, the first thing I do is procrastinate <laughs> okay. for a really long time. Nice. And then I panic. <laughs> No, actually, you know what, I actually start out from the beginning and I start out with ideas and then I procrastinate and then I oh, panic. Okay. Right. Um, no, well, you know, the first thing I like to do when en whenever a performer or a commissioner asks me to write a piece is I want to find out what they want. I like to try to include my performer or my commissioner in the process so that somehow they feel invested in the product. So uh, a performer comes to me and says, hey, Lainey, you know, like Scott Deal, Scott Deal. Uh, hey, Lainey, it's time for us to do another project. Okay, Scott, what do you want? Oh, let's do a vibraphone piece this time. Sounds great. We, you know, then we we talk about maybe ideas for the piece or inspiration for the piece. We experiment with implements, with instruments or, you know, whatever. And um, then I go off and I start writing and I just start composing the material. Then after a while, I send the material to the performer and I say, hey, record this for me. And I already know my signal processing toolbox. So I already kind of have an idea of what it can do, you know, what that it's you know it's like all those little guitar pedals it's like a guitar pedal board right right so i kind of have an idea of what that toolbox can do uh, so i can get an idea in my mind of the electronics but the performer sends me recordings i push them through my toolbox to create the effects and then i program them you know into the final patch I create the score. Again, I talk to the performer. I say, well, how do you want the score to look? Do you, do you want it metered? Do you want graphic oh, notation? Okay. Do you want, you know, time-lapse notation? What? And then I try to do, make it created in a way that, that seems to fit them, that fits their personality, what they, you know, want to okay. see on the page. So this is super interesting to me, but you black box something there really big time, which uh -oh. is you talked about. So I imagine, you know, in my head, I was like, you know, you're, you collect sounds, you do some process planning, you do scoring. And, but you talked about a thing that you said, I composed the piece. And yes. I don't know what you mean. Um, Cause frankly, a lot of people who, compose for instruments do it by scoring the piece on a on a chunk of paper you know get mm -hmm. all their counterpoint correct get all their mm -hmm. lanes working properly all this stuff yep. right your work isn't going to be conducive to that well sometimes it is okay sometimes i do okay <laughs> Well, you know, every it every piece what is, is a what is bit that different. process? What when you say I compose the piece, what does what is that effort look like? When it, you it, have you're on you're on winter break, uh, January seventh, somebody's yes. expecting something on your inbox. Yes, what are you doing? Yeah, I'm in pain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in pain. I'm cursing my life, <laughs> and my husband is hiding somewhere. Yeah, of because course, he knows. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, every piece is a little bit different. So sometimes it is about taking out a piece of paper and doing abstract drawing. Sometimes it's about getting out my keyboard and playing chords. Sometimes it's about opening up Logic Pro and improvising into Logic Pro and then cutting and pasting things. Sometimes it's um, using some Max tools that just generate random things and then seeing what I get. So there's no one, there's no method, no single method. Okay, that's, that's interesting because a lot of times people, 
I mean, like the way you talk about working with Macs where you have a toolbox, a lot of times mm-hmm. people, when they compose, they have some sort of like mental toolbox. And it sounds to me like instead you just kind of open yourself up to where the universe is going to take you. Yeah, I got the mental chaos. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I never know. I mean, it just, I just sort of think about it and I, you know, I'm working on a flute piece right now that I just recently started. And I always start out by going and listening to literature and looking at scores. So I've been spending a lot of time listening to solo flute rep and looking at scores to see how other composers, Mm. how other composers visualize their ideas and listening to the sounds. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. And then sometimes I use poetry to inspire my work, sometimes art, sometimes an idea. It just, I don't know. There's no single way about it, I'm afraid. Yeah, well, that's that's interesting. I guess, you know, what that's going to do is prevent anyone c- from coming up with an Eleni in a box system, right? <laughs> you know, well, no they could, such thing. <laughs> yeah, well, they could. I mean, you know, they and they'd probably come quite close. I, You know, I... I <laughs> I teach all of my students my tricks, so I I always hope that you know my my great goal is that my students are more successful than I am, and and I think in many instances that has been true. I have many former students who have who I'm very proud of their many accomplishments and their com- composition and their creativity. So, you know, the Eleni in a box is maybe sort of the distillation of what people take away mm-hmm. from from either learning or you know it's what we learn from each other. Sure, sure. It's that inspiration that we take all the creative community from each other. So unfortunately, I've already blown through all of our time. I can't believe it. Oh, um, no. I, this is such a great <laughs> conversation. But before we go, I want to just kind of dip a toe into one thing, which is I think of your music. So I've, I go to Seamus conference, conferences, particularly is where I hear your work performed a lot. And um, I always think of it as being really dynamic, really engaging, but also improvisational with the performer. Mm. Um, even when you have fixed media, there's there's a certain amount of freedom that comes that the performer brings to the process. Mm-hmm. But the flip side of it is you're a musician and there's this sense that musicians and composers don't really exist unless they have recorded material and a recording is in this in essence a freezing of that material into a very concrete form yes um and i'm wondering how how satisfied you've been with the recordings of your work and to what extent it recordings feel limiting and in other cases maybe they're freeing because it allows your work to be shared in a way that's that's useful for people. How, how do you feel about the recording process? Because I, I tend to think of that as being very different from how I've always experienced your work. Um, thank you for asking, and I'll try to keep my answer short because I know we're you know we're running out of time. Yeah, don't worry about that part of it. <laughs> I, you know, the recording process to me, it's it's I think it's important to maybe share my work with the community at large for whoever is interested in it. And so doing recordings, of course, audio recordings, and now video recordings, you know, we're, people are moving more toward video recordings, is, is something that I find both gratifying and extremely arduous. I hate it, uh, but it's a necessity. Um, I, I'm very fortunate here at uh, Bowling Green State University. We have a, fanta- a fantastic guy, Mike Lorello, who is the head of our recording services area. And he makes the recording process so easy and so fun and it sounds great. And, you know, we get together and we master the stuff and he's really wonderful to work with. But you're right, it does fix the piece in time. And one of the interesting things about that, and also people who do live streams, like who record their live performances of my piece. So one example is my, uh, I have an alto flute and live electronics piece called Among Fireflies. Mm, Someone could go onto YouTube and find mm, probably more than four, five, six different performers playing that piece 
and each performer brings a tiny different idea to it. So there's one performer who plays my piece and it's super aggressive. It's really right. And then there's another performer who makes it sound like the most beautiful, like gentle kind of thing <laughs> and everything in between, right? I think that this is kind of the beauty of performance is that the performer can bring their own interpretation, their own creativity, their own virtuosity into the interpretation of the music. And so uh, is every recording of my music online the one that I would say, this is the definitive version? No, not necessarily, but I think it's kind of an interesting, it's an uh, just an interesting study to me in how how people interpret music i mean i love all of them i think every single performance every performer who brings their time and energy to performing my music or to or to recording my music they're giving their time and their talents and and they bring something to the table and i love that and then you know we i have something that i can point people to. The hard thing, though, is that when I have especially students who want to play my music and they say, I watched this video right. on YouTube, right? To show me how to, to do say, it. <laughs> right. And then I have to say, OK, you know, it's OK that you watched the video, but don't think that the video is the that you need to imitate this video, right? you should bring your own creative ideas and your own virtuosity to the piece, especially if the piece involves some improvisational elements, right? right? If it's fixed on the page and it's metered, you know, of course, you know, you can pick your own mallets or you can pick your own, you know, you can kind of flex the music a bit, but when there's a little bit of improv involved, as there is with some of my pieces, not all, you know, bring your own ideas to the table right yeah but so. even even on pieces of yours where improv isn't necessarily a part of the composition there's as with any written piece of music there's there's also just interpretation it really mm -hmm. has a huge influence on on what the end result is and, yes. and i i appreciate your answer on this because i i suspected that it there had to be a certain amount to which these recordings and especially these videos are end up being a little bit fraught for you. You know, I like them and I'm thankful for them. Mm. I never really thought about it. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to reflect on that. Of course, with my fixed media music, which people can find on electrocd.com, I have to I have to plug Jean-Francois Denis a little bit of Empreinte Digital. Um, you know, the, those are fixed. And so what you hear is what I composed. And so, right. you know, like it or hate it, that's, <laughs> that's, you know, there's, there's no performer there who can be either credited or blamed for the success or failure. That's all on oh, me. I never right? thought, of, I never thought about the opportunity that, to blame someone as being, oh, well, <laughs> I, I don't mean, well, a credit, you know, credit kidding. them for that's, making I, the I piece it. great. You know, it's either, I just like, I'm always looking, I'm always looking for an out. And so I was hoping maybe we could go with that. Okay. So Lenny, I want to thank you very much for having this conversation. It was really great to talk with you. I wish we could have gone over a bunch more stuff, but we'll have to save that for another time. Before we go, places for people to listen to your work? Certainly. And uh, before I say that, I really just want to thank you very much, Darwin, for reaching out to me and for including me on your amazing podcast. Oh, thank, you. thank you very much. People who are interested in listening to my work can visit electrocd.com or can go to YouTube uh, and just put my type my name in Eleni Lilios or can go to my website which is elilios.com. And I would like to encourage people also to check out Splice Institute if you want to do some electroacoustic awesomeness, including learning Max or learning advanced Max or performing with technology. Splice Institute. Woohoo! <laughs> All right. Fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And with that, I'm going to let you go. Have a good one. Thank you.
Many thanks to Lainey for having this great chat. It was, as you can imagine, uh, it was a long time in the coming, but I am so happy that we were able to pull this off. I really enjoyed it. I learned an awful lot. I hope you did too. Um, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please drop me a line. It's darwin.gross at gmail.com, ddg at cycling74.com, or ddg at 20objects.com. Any of those will work. Um, I want to thank uh, especially all of the people over on Patreon that are Patreon supporters for this. If you are one of those people, make sure you head over there. There's a real neat bit of extra content for you as well. So thank you so much, and uh, we will catch you next time around.